Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I'm your host, Scott Brady, and I am here with a special guest today, John Pangalinen. And John is a creative specialist. This guy makes his living and has spent his life telling stories visually with photography and with video. And he's also built a very cool new Ford Bronco. So we're going to talk a little bit about his Bronco, and then we're going to talk about the lessons that he's learned and the advice that he can give to those of you that are listening on how to best craft your stories for support in the industry. Uh, John is on the receiving end of all of those requests for sponsorship. So John can give some advice on ways to go about that, ways to exceed expectations, and ways to really do your part to make sure that future support is possible, not only for yourself, but for others that come after you. So I think this will be a really interesting conversation. John, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, so you were actually born in the Philippines, is that right? I was. What what area of the F- Philippines were you born in? Uh, it was clo- very close to Manila, if not in Manila, in Veterans Hospital there. Oh, wow, very cool. And And how did you go from being born in the Philippines to then moving to the United States, what, how, what was that process? Uh, my dad was a doctor in the Philippines. My mom was studying to be a nurse. They met at the hospital. Um, my mom was then uh, you know, pregnant with me, had me, and then I had family members that were already in the States. But the easiest way for my parents at the time to get to the States was they moved to Nigeria in Africa. So oh, wow. I actually turned one in Nigeria. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I think I was there for less than a year or so. Uh-huh. Uh, and then we moved to the East Coast and bounced around. Uh, I have three younger brothers. We we are all born in different states. So one, one's in uh, Connecticut, Tennessee, and New York. Wow. And then you ended up spending a chunk of time in New York, but then moving to Southern California, and that's where you've lived ever since. That's correct. Yeah, I've been in, I, I lived in uh, Southern California pretty much, you know, my whole life and in moved around in a couple cities there and just stayed there because that's where my family's at. Oh, for sure. Well, it's great to be around family. And it's kind of an an additional story to all of this. So not only, I mean, I grew up in Southern California. We have have run in similar circles. And in fact, you and I have, have shared a cocktail or a meal at many different events. In fact, I remember a great Snow Peak party we were at one year for outdoor retailer, and that was a lot of fun and catching up. Uh, But then also... Our, our uh, video director, Ryan Keegan, you guys actually grew up together, kind of spent some time together. Yeah, we grew up in, in the city called La Mirada in, in California, just grew up skateboarding, and that's <laughs> yeah. really how we got that's to know great. each other. And then uh, the, the funny story was, you know, we, you know, we went our separate ways. Ryan did his thing, I did my thing, but then this world brought us together along with Instagram. Um, and then I placed an order to try to catch up on past issues. Yeah. And he sent me like a little note with the, when the issues came to my house, I'm like, oh. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and Ryan is still skateboarding. In fact, the only thing that he tells me is he says he doesn't bounce as well as he used to. So, you know, it's, it's amazing that he's still keeping that up. What a dangerous activity. I, I wish I could still skate. My back's too messed up now. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of skateboarders say that, you know, when they hit their 40s, they're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have bounced so many times. Yeah. Well, what a, what a great area to grow up creatively. And that has no doubt led to some of your story. You, you talked about being involved with the drifting scene. How did that begin to shape some of your insights around good storytelling? Because you guys were literally creating an industry. So talk a little bit about what you learned in that process. Absolutely. So when drifting was first coming to the United States um, and the group of guys that brought the sport to the States, um, they, uh, they, they definitely helped create this new culture, right? And it's an extension of the, the import car scene and, but it was exciting because it was actually on the track. It was like, yeah. you know, a lot of people called it stunt driving uh, with control and with and in competition. And so that was, you know, that also had similar um, feelings of action sports. And so that really intrigued me. Um, you know, fast forward a couple of years as the scene group got bigger, 
um, the agency I was with, we became the agency of record for them and we did creative um, and PR. Part of the PR gig was really um, approving media members. Sure. So, and back then we had so many guys that were just hungry and very talented and it was a matter of uh, figuring out who made the most sense, who was with real uh, le- legitimate media outlets and just giving these guys a shot. And a lot of these names and a lot of the guys that started in the drifting world are now, you know, well-established photographers, guys like Larry Chen, who's a, a Canon brand ambassador. Um, and there's just so many other guys that just, but they started from the world of formula drift and, and in the drifting scene. So um, this leads me to a question. If someone was to come to you saying, I would like to start to tell these stories of this segment. So let's, Let's do it in the context of overlanding, that someone is looking to get involved with media. Now I have some insights that I'll share as well, but from your perspective, what were you looking for? What were the key attributes that you were looking for in those individuals that allowed you to give them that chance? I think number one was, you know, we, we looked for uh, the outlets that they were associated with or the brands, whether it was a, a tire company or a a suspension company that was vouching for these guys or the drivers teams themselves. But often we would have a pool of like 200 to 400 media members and, you know, trying to cut it down from, you know, 500 media requests is kind of, you know, is a, was a little bit of a challenge. So going, so what we would do is first, you know, verify that they they are with an outlet too, is then check them out creatively because some guys yeah. you just want to give a chance, sure. Because they you could see from a lot of talent, the yeah. content that they were creating, the the images, the visuals that they, these guys really had talent and 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 could create and tell a story. And so a lot of um, a lot of times we would just give them a pass, or at least I would give them a pass to let's see what they could do, let's see what type of story they could create at this event and round. So I think for overlanders it'd be the same thing. It's First, go out and do it. Go shoot. Don't just expect that you just came out of school, you have a camera, yeah. and you're going to be able to hang with these guys. And, you know, second would be stay professional. You know, don't cause any danger. Don't do things you're not supposed to. Get a lay of the land. Learn first what is accepted and what's – um, and, and just what is the proper way to do things. You know, you kind of have to – at least in my eyes, you need to kind of earn your keep, you know, yeah, before sure. you're just – thrown in in the fire you know and especially with overlanding you know the, you have so many places you can go and a lot of people just are a little disrespectful i feel like um, no that's such a valid a valid thing we're seeing that more and more with overlanding as more folks are getting involved they just haven't gone through that process of of recognizing how much public land we've lost access to because of people's poor treatment of the land so making sure that the media that they're producing always reflects tread lightly and is always respectful of of the land because once that image goes out into the world you can't get it back like you think you can but no it's a it's out there forever and then people say oh that was the guy who tore up the side of this mountain or whatever yeah and you know at the end of the day it's not worth it for a photo for yeah. instagram you know or a video it's just it's just not and i think you know the educational process and and people just being respectful and and humble enough to understand that you know regardless of the amount of followers, you know, even more so if you have a lot of followers, you should be setting the example. And so, you know, just knowing those things, I think that's, those are types of things that we look at, you know, when, when you're creating content out in the outdoors, you don't want to be just a, just like this quote unquote influencer that sure doesn't really give back. They just try to take. Yeah, sure. And there's a lot of that because individuals will associate uh, the number of followers with that that has value, and oftentimes it does. But there's a lot of other things that we look at. Like we look at um, what is their reputation in the industry. We'll talk to some individuals that they've worked with uh, just to get a gauge. Would you work with this person again? And we'll ask that. And it's it's interesting the number of times that someone will say, "Yeah, I wouldn't work with that person again," because oftentimes what happens is, let's say someone is given a set of wheels or they're given. Um, like Pelican cases, I know you work with Pelican, and then they don't do the work. They don't actually deliver on what they said they were going to do. And then that starts to, despite the number of followers you have, in the industry folks talk, professionals talk, and it's going to, it's pretty interesting. We've seen some, some folks that with large followings that they're kind of now in the, 
in the shadows because they didn't follow through on what they said they were going to do. Absolutely. And it's a small industry, right? Yep. So, you know, I, you know, I, you mentioned Pelican, you know, I also work with Toyo and I do receive a lot of proposals, a lot of requests, um, even DMS, you know, requesting yep. product. Yeah. And uh, most of the people are very respectful or ask how, or, or if they can at least just get a discount. Some people expect something and yeah. that's where it kind of, it's a, it's a turnoff. It's, um, you know, I don't care if you have a million followers and then I have been burned, you know, we have sent product out and we get nothing back yep. and, you know, that's just, I guess the nature of the game, but sure. You know, um, I'm getting really good at knowing who yeah, to get sure. product to and not yeah, and sure. trying to keep also create, at least for the, the two brands that I represent, um, create kind of a, a family team atmosphere. So where everyone gets along, everyone can do stuff and everyone wants to participate and, um, be part of the program, you know, and not just, uh, receive product and and then do one post and call it a day you know it's really like hey what else can we do together it's a collaborative effort you know yes it absolutely is and when we get inquiries from media either professionals or aspiring media professionals so we'll do that we'll check their references uh, we are very interested in their first packages and their first communications it's interesting someone will reach out to Overland Journal to write an article and they are struggling to construct a sentence in an email. What that tells us is it, it doesn't mean that they're not a great traveler or that they're not going to even be a potentially be a great contributor. It just means that it's going to be a lot more work for us because they may just not have that experience around grammar, spelling, all of these other things that are really important and take a lot of time for our team. So that first impression is so critical. When that email comes in, that it is, at, you should at least have it edited. <laughs> have someone else take a look at it. Because it's funny how much we miss, even if we're, we're pretty experienced ourselves. I miss stuff all the time, and that's why we have amazing editors, is because I miss things too. But making sure that that first correspondence is really professional, gets to the point, talks about what you want to deliver, when you can deliver it by, um, give some examples of what the outcome might look like. The one thing that we love, this is an example that can really help the listeners here is we love it when someone sends a complete package. And I bet you that's the same for you. Somebody who maybe even bought Toyo tires themselves and they've got, they've pulled together all these photos. They've got a little testimony and they send you like a thank you. Hey, I love your tires. I just want you to know how I've been using them. Here's my Instagram account. This is a bunch of photos. You guys are welcome to use them. That probably endears you to them immediately. It definitely does. You know, I think loyalty is very important, you know, Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that um, they they want the the bigger, better deal. Sure. And so if someone's offering them something shiny on on one end, they even though they were with one brand for for quite a few years, they might jump ship. It's always hard to come back. That's right? true. You, know, you don't want to burn those bridges. And again, it's a small industry, so word gets around, and mm -hmm. it, it can it can definitely hurt. Um, but I think for those that are loyal, and you know, and there there are other instances like maybe you prefer a different tire for a different type of vehicle. Well, sure. That's fine too, you know. Of course. But, but being like, upfront about that. Absolutely. That's what it yeah. is. It's communication, just uh, no surprises. Yeah. And and if it's being used in the context of editorial, like for us, uh, we don't do sponsorships. We get product to evaluate for editorial. Oftentimes we pay for it ourselves. But our goal is to really evaluate the product and then get that information out. Um, so that's an advantage to the manufacturer who's provided it is that then it comes with this expert opinion around how the product performed. So I think if, if someone is an influencer, it's really important for them to determine what it is that they want to do. If they want to evaluate equipment, if they want to have a journalistic approach, they need to be very clear about the fact that that's what they're doing and then not get, you can't be compensated for that. If you're being compensated for your opinion, then I believe that that's a conflict of interest. Now, that doesn't mean that someone can't show beautiful pictures and, and like, hey, thanks, Toyos, for getting me through the day kind of a thing. But if you're saying, oh, these Toyos are better than the BF Goodrich that I took off and you just got paid to do that, then that's, of course, a conflict of interest. And definitely. people find that out really quick. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think with, with um, in regards to, you know, the, the editorial and versus the, the sponsorship, on the editorial side, you definitely cannot take any yeah. any sort of payment. You know, that I think that's why, you know, just having that journalistic integrity is, yep. is very important and keeping it church and state separate. Um, 
and then from the influencer side, it's, you know, just being up front, you know, when not expecting, you know, we, we, from, from most of the brands I work with or have worked with, we typically don't pay influencers. Um, you know, the product usually speaks for itself and sure. you know, it's something that they want to use. Um, that it, they shouldn't be paid to use it. Now it'd be different if they, if we use an image for an ad or, sure. or some marketing campaign, then they should be compensated, you know, for their time and their as talent. A, yeah. Sure. And as a photographer and, and a video producer, I, I, I understand that side of it too. So it's a, it, it can get complicated and tricky. Yeah. So it's really, <laughs> how do you navigate this and, and make it work? Yeah, and I think just the more upfront people are, the more transparent they are. Like, if you get a free set of tires and you're an influencer, and like, just just say like, thanks Toyo for providing these tires for me. Like, it allows me to have my adventure. And but then you've disclosed that to your audience that that it it was it was a sponsorship. I think that that's really important. So yeah, uh, you know, sponsorship should still be like like anyone else. Like, you should be proud to be sponsored. You know, yeah, just like LeBron's. Sp- Sponsored by Nike. Like he, yeah, you know, sure. he's probably There's no really question. Proud that <laughs> yeah. He's a Nike athlete. Yeah, no question. Yeah, I mean, imagine that day when he gets signed by Nike. Yeah. That would have been an incredible experience for him. So on on the the sponsorship side, you get fielded hundreds of requests, I suspect, a month or close to it. Um, so what what do you look for? Like if someone was to give you the ultimate pitch like something that you would have found that really works in the past what does that normally look like you know it really depends on what if it's aligning with the the goals that we currently have so for example for toyo right now the open country line of tires is very popular the the at3 launched more recently and so we're looking to be able to see um tires that go on those on those vehicles right and we want to make sure that we're going to the right storytellers um the guys that have a decent amount of followers, because obviously you don't want to give um, tires to someone that maybe only has a couple hundred people yeah, that sure. are seeing it, because it's you're not going to get the most bang for your buck. Quality of content, um, and then it also depends on you know, are they going to provide us with content? Are they going to run a decal? Are they attending events? Do they have media coverage planned out? Um, you know, all of those things we take into consideration, and then from there we're, we're able to determine if we have the budget to. Yeah. support that and uh, you know as you know truck tires aren't cheap so they're not yeah they're very expensive and there's not a lot of margin in them either because there's so much competition for tires so no that's interesting and and <clears throat> for those that are listening just recognizing that all of these companies they do have a marketing budget that they're working against so if someone says i'm sorry i can't support you right now it, it doesn't even necessarily mean that they don't like what you pitched it may just mean that they don't have the budget anymore that they've they've sent out all the tires that they can send out and we've also seen for example like currently there's a a shortage of a lot of equipment so there are some things that are just simply not available we were doing uh, a winch test recently and we could normally warren would be very supportive of editorial and they would send a product to test Um, it was just not available from warren so we had to find it in the ways that we could and buy it ourselves because it was really important for us to demonstrate the success of that product in the test because uh, it was being tested against six other products. So there's a lot of times that it's not that they don't want to help or that you don't have a great story to tell. They just may not have either the budget or the inventory. Yeah. In- inventory issues, especially in the last couple of years have been plaguing everyone. You know, there's a lot of shortage of supplies, workers at the factory. Yeah. So everything is a little bit, you know, on the manufacturing side is, has slowed down. Um, so, you know, thankfully, you know, we've been able, we, the people that we work with are very understanding as well as we're also able to, um, work our magic and, and sure. try to get tires to the people that need to get them. Yeah, sure. Now that makes a lot of sense. Well, so the, the next question for me then is now that someone wants to start to tell a story, uh, to their audience, whatever size that it may be, or maybe they really want to build an audience. What are some adv- what's some advice that you would give someone that wants to build up their audience on Instagram or you know, on Facebook or on TikTok or whatever platform that they're choosing to to focus on? What are some pieces of advice you'd give to them? I think number one is just consistency. You know, you, from the from the people that we work with that have large followings, they didn't give up. They they stayed true to their voice. They told their story. And even if there was only a few 
people viewing their image or liking their image, they kept at it. And, you know, it takes time to build an audience. It really does. And, you know, you can't expect to, uh, you know, to, to do a couple of posts and all of a sudden you're this famous celebrity. <laughs> sure. And so sure. Consistency is definitely key. I think quality of content, making sure it's, you're using the best technology you can afford. Um, although you don't really need to have like the best camera you might have just a good iPhone, but also having just that creative eye helps sure. a lot. And, uh, um, and staying with the trends, you know, obviously the, the algorithms that are, uh, are tricky these days, um, to grow that audience. Um, and I think if you can find your own natural voice, that's important too. And I, you know, that's really it. It's just sticking with it. You know, I, I see a lot of people that they give a shot, they give it a shot for a, a few months. Yeah. Um, and then they, they give up. You know? Yeah. And, I mean, it's hard. It's like, it's probably like this podcast, you know, you have to start, you know, although you had an audience already. Sure. It know, took time. Yeah. It takes a lot of time and dedication out of your day. And, you know, that's another thing is like, do you have the time to do it? Can you support this? Is it worth it to you to, to give up whatever else you're doing and um, to really go after it? It's, it's yeah. like anything else. If you are passionate about it, you're going to do well and it'll show. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's really all I have. I mean, I don't have a large following myself. But, but, I'm but you work with bl- brands that do. Yeah, I for do. Sure. <laughs> well, so you certainly have learned what works. And for us, it's the same way. We choose, when we choose to do something new as an organization, we think about it for a long time and we make sure that we understand it and that we can serve the audience properly with the content. So it'll be years between us doing something new because um, we really want to continue to be great at the things that we're already doing. Um, and we try really hard to continue to be great at those things. And that takes a lot of energy. So when we bring up something like a podcast, it's so important to have all of the right pieces. And then to your point, being able to do it week in and week out and stick with it. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Too often people, you know, give up on themselves. You know, I think that's the, one of the problems of social media is that if you're not getting the likes, the clicks, you, um, you know, it, it can affect your mental health a little mm. bit. And I think that's going to be a problem more so, especially when you see other people, you know, you get a little bit of a FOMO. So it, it really, you you have to be tough. You have to be able to continue doing what you're doing and and just have a little bit of a of a, of a drive and, and a little bit of a thick skin as well mm. in order to, to succeed at this. Well, and you mentioned that your your degree is actually in psychology and social behavior. So that's an interesting question. When it comes to platforms like Instagram, have you found either advice or things that work to help people maintain that healthy perspective or to be as healthy as possible around social media? And what would you suggest that people consider? I think the the people that are very successful are honest and honest with their audience and also open, right? There's there's a lot of people that curate their stories. They don't show the downsides of, of things. And there are a lot of people that show, share everything, the down, the ups, the downs and, and everything around it. And, um, I think the ones that are open probably have the best engagement, have the, have a more authentic and genuine following. Um, I, I don't know if, uh, if you, you know, getting a lot of likes and clicks translates for some of the brands into sales necessarily, you know, for, so for us, we look at what will, uh, what will, what will eventually, you know, create a customer or, or someone loyal to the brand. And, you know, I think some I see people what you're saying. Are, yeah. are now pushing what they think their audience wants to see and, and, and compromising what, you know, what they're doing. And, uh, you know, I think it's also healthy to take a break every now and then, Yeah, you know, and just, you know, you have to do what you have to do that, you know, your health comes number one. For sure. Yeah, I had a I had a, a pretty serious family loss recently, and I just completely stopped for I needed to. I mean, I it was a, a really uh, significant loss for my family, so I just didn't even open up Instagram, and I got back on probably four weeks later, and just the number of messages and everything. But I realized that that it was okay. Like it's all right to do that, and maybe it's really a good idea to do that. And I think to your point also is like, let's say you take a, 
a musician or a celebrity that has a, a massive following because of their talent as a creative that would not necessarily translate to selling tires. That's true. And that, and I think that we're seeing that more and more is brands being discerning around conversions. So audience size does not relate to conversions. So like a, another good example of that in the automotive industry is maybe someone who has a very inexpensive car, like they've got like a 30 year old, um, Porsche unmodified and they have this huge following because the person's really funny and their photos are great and everything. But him putting new tires on that Porsche probably does not translate into a lot of sales. Uh, where it's, if it's someone with a newer car that is more interested in the aftermarket and the aftermarket is being supported on that channel, then you'd probably see a higher conversion. Exactly. So, you know, there's a lot of factors um, in, in someone's feed that we, we definitely look at, and that's that's one. Does it make sense? Is there audience, the type of audience that will purchase tires or any other parts for that matter, or are they s- simply looking at it because it's a pretty car that they like yeah, in, sure. in these uh, beautiful uh, landscapes? Yeah, pretty car, pretty person, something that is it's visually interesting in and of itself but doesn't necessarily translate to an enthusiast for sure. Well, let's pivot a little bit towards production and photography. So talk a little bit about what is your kit? What do you use when you want to go out and shoot a, shoot a car? So when we do some, it depends on the shoot, right? Obviously if we're doing something just quick and easy, you know, I'm shooting my personal car for something. Um, It's a small kit. You know, I use, I have a Pelican air um, case that travels with me almost everywhere. Uh, and I use a Sony, I have a Sony a7 R2 camera, which is like my backup event camera. So you'll see me at trade shows with that because it's light and nimble, easy to use. Super easy. Yeah. But my, my workhorse now is a, is a Canon R5. And then I've hosted lenses, um, always in the kit, uh, you know, every memory cards, filters, all yeah. of that fun stuff. Um, I, u- I do use a lot of strobe lighting. I use pro photo. Um, and it, it just depends on the shoot. If it's a commercial shoot, we, we just wrapped up a couple projects last year with Lincoln and, um, yeah, there's a lot of lighting, a lot of production goes into that. It's more or less a, a full day shoot for something like that. But if it's something in the outdoors, you just use natural light, you use what yeah. you have. Sometimes you'll strobe something or, or, or have a light bar or, or something like that. But it, it just really depends. Yeah, Or a nice reflector or just yeah. waiting for the light to get right. It's, it's interesting uh, when when we do shoots, if we take the time to make sure we're in the right location with the right light, it just it the photographer hasn't changed. It's still the same person, but the outcome is an order of magnitude more beautiful because all of that energy was spent on finding the right scene and the right light and the right color of vehicle, and then it completely changes it. Yeah, planning is everything. You know, it, it can save you hours and and a lot of post processing time as well. Um, I just finished it. I went on this event called the Overland Express Rally through Death Valley recently, and I was hired to shoot it, the event. You know, that's more run and gun. You're sh- I'm shooting sure. out the window. I'm jumping out of the car. Yeah. I'm getting muddy, dirty, shooting what, whatever I can. But at the same time, I can't hold the group back because, one, I don't know where the next end point is. I don't sure. know if we're going to stop. Um, two, uh, you know, it's just you just got to capture what you can where you are. And, you know, I think, that's, you know, a little bit of advice is just, you just have to be ready, you know, and, yeah. and just get what you can. Sometimes it's not going to be the per- perfect moment or the perfect settings, or you just have to do what you can in that moment. Some of the advice that we will give folks in that scenario is you want to try to capture three different perspectives. You want to capture the landscape, the environment that you're in. You want to capture the subject, which may be a, a person cooking dinner or, or, deflating a tire so you've got this portrait and then you want to capture the details and a lot of times I'll see people out shooting they're shooting everything at six one six foot so they're all standing up with their and it's all the same perspective or their phone is held up in front of their face instead of getting down low or getting up high or changing the focal length so that way it starts to look different and if when people shoot every time you get out to take a photograph it's probably worth taking the time to get a landscape shot or get the vehicle or the person in the context of their space, getting that beautiful portrait and then getting the detail of something. Maybe that's the tire print on the ground or maybe that's the Choya cactus that's stuck into the tread or 
or maybe it's the splatter of mud up the side of the vehicle, or, or maybe it's just like the eye and the, and a curl of a smile of the person driving the vehicle. And if we can capture those three perspectives as much as we can, then we end up with a really nice visual story. That's one of our biggest challenges with Overland Journal is we get a lot of front three quarter center punched vehicle in, in midday light. And it's just not usable. Like we have to, we can't use the content. Whereas if people take the time, like we said, to get the right light, get those multiple perspectives, use rule of thirds, things that start to tell a more beautiful story visually, then that's content that we can use. Definitely. I, you know, you hit it right on the head. It's, it's really being prepared and telling that visual story. It's, you know, you, you can't just get one, especially for editorial, right? You have to tell a story. You have to tell what, yeah. who's the person, what, what's, what are the details of the vehicle? Where did they go? What about the landscapes? Where, where did they travel to? What are the conditions, the terrain, all of it, you know? And yeah, it's digital, so it's essentially free, right? Just burn, <laughs> burn megapixels, yeah. burn them. Yeah, totally. This content is brought to you by Overland Journal, our premium quality print publication. The magazine was founded in 2006 with the goal of providing independent equipment and vehicle reviews, along with the most stunning adventures and photography. We care deeply about the countries and cultures we visit and share our experiences freely with our readers. We also have zero advertorial policy and do not accept any advertiser compensation for our reviews. By subscribing to Overland Journal, you're helping to support our employee-owned and veteran-owned publication. Your support also provides resources and funding for content like you are watching or listening to right now. You can subscribe directly on our website at overlandjournal.com. What are you seeing as as trends or piece of advice around video production now? Are you seeing things that are really working? I mean, is it true that we need to be focusing a lot of energy now on these very snackable, um, you know, call it a TikTok or a Reels format? Do people really need to be paying attention to that right now? Or you think there's still room for mid and long length video? I think it's both, right? It also depends on your audience. Um, if you want to reach the, the younger consumer and audience, then you definitely have to do the snackable um, little stories, little tidbits, and because that's where the audience is. They're on TikTok. They're watching the reels. Instagram's pushing the reels more and more. So you definitely should be creating that type of content. But, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit older as well, and I appreciate the long-form content as well. And I think there's definitely um, people that will, will watch everything. Yeah. And then you'll have some guys that will watch some of it and, and some guys that will watch, you know, the, the rest. But... Um, you know, you, ha- you also have to think about the attention spans of people. It's, it's getting shorter it, and shorter. It's not what it once was for sure. Yeah, for sure. Well, and that's just, I guess, just being recognizing that that's where the audience is going and that's just okay. It doesn't, it's not that I, it's not my place to change it. My, my job is to tell a story and my job is to test equipment. And if people are consuming that content in a different way, that's okay. We just need to adjust and, and, uh, not be upset that the cheese is moving. Yeah, or use one to promote the other. Right, mm-hmm. you do a fifteen-second teaser um, of you know changing tires, and and then go into the deeper dive of, of why you change the tires on the long format. Right. Yeah, so for just, sure. You, you just have to use all the platforms. So, you know, social media and uh, and the roles that that they're creating. Um, you know, there's definitely a career. That, uh, that you can have. Yeah, no question. <laughs> it's amazing the amount of energy that it takes to do that properly. Yeah, definitely. All right, so that leads me then to shifting gears a little bit, and let's talk about your Bronco. So I had the chance to, to test a, um, a wild, wild track Bronco a couple months ago, lockers, front and rear, sway bar disconnects, all the goodies. You had to have gotten one of the first bron- Broncos off the line. I mean, you Yours has got to be an early car. I, I think mine's pretty early. I got it um, October 4th, so right right towards the beginning. Um, I also placed my order uh, on day two, uh, and I made, um, I made a few changes to try to get it ahead of time. I played that game. There was a 
a lot of things going around on, on online and on the forums that were like, okay, if you did this, you can get it this mi- this much earlier because there's delays with the hard tops or, or whatever. So got it pretty early. I also built it um, to the specs that I, that I think that I would use, you know, cause I, I don't do much rock crawling. I sure. You know, it's more of a daily driver for me and family vehicle for the weekends. And so I wanted, that's why I chose a four door. I also wanted to be comfortable. So I went with the, and I also just like the look of the outer banks with the painted fenders. And yeah, yeah. so I w- went with that and I also knew I was going to modify it. So, you know, I, I definitely chose the, the vehicle that, that I want, that I would use for myself, that, that would be the most, um, that, that would make the most sense without going overboard. I, I think the wild track is a little rare right now to yeah, find yeah. as well. Super hard, but probably super find. fun. Oh, it's, it's amazing. But you you're, you're Bronco is amazing. I mean, that color that you picked. So we're going to include photographs in the YouTube version of this so that people can see it. We'll even have some video of it as well. Uh, Ryan and John are going to go out and shoot a full feature on the truck as well. So that'll be available on the YouTube channel for those who want to see this car. But this this color, it's probably one of the coolest colors I've ever seen on a Bronco. Now, what inspired you to use that color? It's it's kind of um, for those that are just listening. Like, how would you describe the color? It, it's I would say it's in between like an olive green and a mint green. If those two colors had a baby, it become <laughs> it would be boxwood green. Okay, so and, it's called boxwood green. Yeah, cool. and, and and it's a it's actually a, a older uh, Ford Bronco color. So I wanted to original Bronco or Bronco. I, I believe it's one of the originals or okay, got a, an early Bronco sure. color, and it's. Um, I've seen it in person and I, I took a mental note of it and it was something that, you know, I, when I saw the Bronco first, I'm like, wow, they really kept to the, the old body style. They really yeah. kept, they, you know, so I, so in my build, I wanted to do something different. I knew that people were going to go crazy with the modifications. The accessories are going to go full off road. Well, that's not really me, you know? And, yeah. Um, I always like to have a little bit of style and, and I'm, known a little bit for the color choices that I've, I've done with the, ve- the project vehicles that I've done. And so that green was really stood out and I, it pays homage to the, to the iconic Bronco. So I and it's that. also understated. It's yes. not a, it's not a very flashy color. It's just extremely handsome on the truck. And then the second thing that you notice is the white grill. Did you do, is there anything different about that grill or just because it's white like that against that green that it looks so different? Well, the, it's a different grill. I, the Outer Banks has a slightly different, uh, well, it's the same shape and size, but it has different, as for some reason, Ford changed every grill on every model of got the it. Bronco. So I got the Badlands grill because I thought it looked the best. And then I also have the, the Kid Tracks, which is kind of like a Power Wheels Bronco for my kids. And I had it painted <laughs> to match. Oh, and sweet. it had the Badlands grill too. So to match them better, I, I changed my grill. To, and painted it and had it painted white. Yeah, you wanted to match your kid's grill. Yeah. That's good. I yeah. like that. So That's matching awesome. vehicles and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a photo. Of that yeah, we got to get, we totally <laughs> got to get your kid's truck. That's awesome. And then the other thing that really stands out is the white wheels. So talk about the wheels that are on there and why did you choose those? So I have a set of the 1552 analog wheels. Um, I believe I have the first set of white analog wheels for the Bronco that came into the States. Uh, thankfully, I know those guys over there, and they were kind enough to hold them for me for the vehicle until my my truck came. Um, but that that ultimately ma- gave me the decision to then paint the car. Um, you know, it was a brand new vehicle. Like, why why do you paint it? But that's crazy. You know, I wanted to stand out again, and and also I knew it was going to be displayed with Toyo at um at SEMA. So to stand out at SEMA, you have to do some crazy things sometimes. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, the, those white wheels, they, they look like an old, old school steel wheel, but they're not, but they're aluminum. And I think they look great. In fact, I think Matt Scott, the co-host of the, of the show has those same wheels on his LJ Jeep and they, and they're, they're in black on his, his Jeep and they look they look so good. Now, the other thing that I noticed in the back is because you're a photographer and you do go camping with your family and everything, you've got, you've paid attention to some organization in the back of the the Bronco. What did you install back there that kind of helps you make the best use of that small space? So in, in the back, first, the, the Bronco has no cargo space. Yeah, you know, very little. Coming from an SUV into the Bronco, there's not much. And I can't really put my seats down when I have my kids in the back because they're in the back. 
So I have um, the goose gear plate in the back, which, you know, adds a little bit of uh, some protection and uh, makes it really easy to just throw things in and out. I have their their um, tailgate table, which folds down nicely. Yeah, and, that looks great. And, uh, yeah, I can put my grill on there. I can do my coffee setup, my cameras, whatever. That that comes in really handy. Yeah, having a work table. Since, it doesn't, since the truck doesn't have a tailgate, yeah. it becomes your tailgate, which is perfect. Exactly. And then I have a, a Dometic CFX uh, fridge in there and with the – with the goose gear, um, what is it, the camp kitchen. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, and then it slides out really nice and easy. And, yeah, and so everything is in the back organized. I typically have my Pelican camera case with me. I have uh, a Pelican Cargo BX50, which just is dry storage. Mm-hmm. But inside there right now is like, I think I have um, I have a couple, uh, I have all of my coffee making kit <laughs> it's important man it, it is it's important <laughs> you know i don't know how long ryan's gonna have me out on the trails tomorrow <laughs> and it's cold out here yeah it is it's right <laughs> it's you're, you're from southern california yeah. this is cold there's actually snow on the ground yeah. in prescott right now yeah so i brought so i brought the <laughs> coffee kit along with awesome the, <laughs> my goal is zero and then i just you know just to make it easy and i didn't want to bring propane i just brought my uh, electric uh, water kettle thing so. oh that's great so you've had the bronco now then for you know five six months how how has it held up? Have you enjoyed the truck? What are the things that you've learned? The pros and cons, like to give the listener, like what's the lowdown on the on the Ford Bronco now that you've owned it for as long as you have? Uh, first off, I love Ford, um, but uh, it, they've um, they've been a great client. But uh, the Bronco itself, I think, one, it looks awesome, and yeah. I get the most compliments I've ever gotten, both male, female, thumbs out the window, people stopping me at Target, you know, to talk about it. So it's an exciting truck. Um, but there, there are a couple downsides. One, I think, is with the soft top, it is loud inside, especially on the freeway at speed. But with the, the B&O sound the system. The hard top is loud too, man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the soft top was a good choice. And it looks great. And it looks great. And it's fun to take the top down. Yeah, for sure. The, but then I lose um, the ability to have a, a rack on top so i lose more storage space or for a tent or whatever else on you know um but with the top down i could also fit a, a surfboard you know so there there are definitely pros and cons and so sure. i'm looking forward to the summer and because I, I i'm not much of a cold weather surfer yeah yeah um uh, the other thing that i came across was the back seats with my two kids and they're not they're not big they're three and four or three and five sorry cruz um <laughs> <laughs> so my original car seats have a higher bolster. So there was only this little window where they could fit in. I'd have to put him, carry him up and the, the trucks lifted and I'm not the tallest guy, put him sideways and then put him in. <laughs> You're talking about your kid. You got to put yeah. your kid sideways yeah, and then put to him, fit him in. So he didn't slam his head on the <laughs> oh, top, no. which I've done a couple of times. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thankfully I, I got new car seats from this brand called Diono and they have the, the lowest bolster and they're the, the brand that's known for doing three across in the back. I only have got two it. kids, but every bit of space helps and so that helped a lot in in terms of having them fit but also you know uh my wife and i are both not the biggest of people and their feet and legs still touch the back or can so that's you know it's not the biggest of space and it and i get it because they have stadium seating in the back sure it's it's raised up higher so you don't get car sick on the trails and sure Although my, my daughter did get car sick on her last joshua tree trip oh no that was probably (laughs) exciting yeah, that's so nice. when you glad the interior can hose out, I, I don't have the hose out. Interior. Oh no! <laughs> but she kept it on herself. Oh and no! And we yeah, just had okay, to change gotcha. her. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, adventures, yeah. Yeah, adventures know. in family travel, the dad life. Yeah. yeah, that's great, man. That's but, awesome. You know, that's what that's what it's for. And uh, you know, outside of that, the kids love it. I mean, I pick them up from school. They they can point it out. They they're like they they call the Bronco the Bronco. You know, I'm not one of those guys that names the my cars. Sure. So, <laughs> They, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a vehicle that is fun. I mean, it checked all the boxes for a vehicle that I wanted, right? I wanted something capable for when we do go on trips and, and things and do go camping and on trails. And it, it, we're just going to have a blast this spring and summer, I think. And um, it also just, uh, it's just an iconic vehicle. And just to have it, totally. it's, it's really fun, you know. But yeah, it's special. I mean, if I had... The, say the, the the garage space um it would be more of a weekend vehicle than yeah. than my daily driver which it is right now but it's uh you know outside of that it's uh it's been fun i, I mean i haven't knock on wood 
broken anything yet. You know, I've done a couple trails. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it's just one of those things, one of those vehicles that you, you, it feels special driving and, um, you look forward to getting into, you know, it's, it's fun. Yeah. yeah. The one that we had was so fun. So, um, another question when we had the, the test vehicle that we had, we noticed that some of the interior materials were maybe not super durable. Have you, but we didn't know how that was going to go long term. Our very short term experience led us to believe that those interior materials may not hold up very well. How have you had your, like, how is your dash held up? The plastic, is that holding up okay? So far, so good. And, you know, no issues with the dash, although um, I do want to wrap it to match because it, I had the navy pure interior, and I just don't think that it matches right with the green Got it. color scheme. So I found one upholstery um, shop that said they can do it. The first shop wasn't very confident. Um, and I did have it, all my seats rewrapped with cat skin, uh, the leather. So that's held up pretty well. Um, I, I do notice that the, the back cargo area does scratch a little bit. Yeah, that's what we experienced was uh, like the dash itself and then some of the like the, the fascias on the doors, just a lot of small scratches came up pretty quickly. Is that what you've experienced or not, not, not so bad? Really. I'm also oh, that's good. pretty careful too. And mm-hmm. I haven't had, you know, even with the kids, like no major issues there or that I notice. Mm-hmm. I also have a really good detail guy. <laughs> oh, that's good. Good guy to have. Now, do you have the 2.3 liter or the 2.7? I have the 2.7. Yeah, that's a nice motor. Geez, that, it rips. Yeah. And yours is the automatic or the manual? automatic nice well it is a great looking truck and it'll be fun to have it here to support the youtube side of it and then people will be able to check it out a full video of it as well so that that is a really handsome vehicle and when it comes to building vehicles one of the things that i noticed about yours and it it's consistent with the way that i like to build vehicles as well is just to be a little more elegant and understated I think that people make the mistake of putting so much stuff on their vehicles that they, that it kind of, it doesn't end up looking very clean or very, even very elegant at the end of the day. So have you found that to be the case? Are people better off underdoing the vehicle and then focusing on something special like the paint color? Or do you find that it actually does work just as well to bolt on a bunch of accessories? I guess that comes down to personal preference and style, right? And also, what, what's the utility of the vehicle, right? I, I wasn't, I know who, who I am and I know, you know, I'm confident enough to say I don't need to do that much to, for, to a vehicle to make it look good and perform well. Um, I think, you know, as I, I've gotten older, I think simple is, um, is more my style now and, yeah. and doing a couple pop elements, you know, the wheels, the paint now, and then also choosing how do colors work well together. It, you know, I painted the originally the, even the side mirrors were um, body match. So instead of going to the green, I kept it, I, I painted it black actually, just so that, that line flowed well. The belt line was uninterrupted. Yeah. yeah. You know, I nice. try to look at those little design touches, you know, am I going to paint the door handles white and the fenders white? And you know, no, not really. Cause I think that's a little bit too much and playing off of that theme uh, too, too much, at least for my style. Right. And I, yeah. again, everyone has their own style. I, you know, I could have added, a million lights to it, but I think that distracts from the vehicle. And how often am I really going to drive at night? You know, mm-hmm. I try to get to the campsite before it gets cold. You know, I don't like setting up at, at dark. Um, so that's you know, I you I think you have to know your personal style, um, also what you plan to achieve, and do you want your vehicle to stand out that much and with all these accessories attached to it? Because now you know if you're going anywhere, you can have it taken, stolen. Yeah. And just, you don't want that. Uh, and then, you know, the gas mileage on the Bronco isn't, I, we didn't talk about this, but it's not the best. Yeah, and, sure. And so. Yeah, imagine yeah. a roof rack or a roof yeah. tent on there. It would just affect it even exactly. more, for sure. You know, and gas prices these days aren't. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's expensive, for sure. Well, the truck looks great. And congratulations on, first of all, even getting a Bronco, which people have been waiting for a very long time to get a car. And then with how awesome it looks, too. And, and I really appreciate your insights on content and on working with professionals and aspiring professionals in the space. 
Um, as a content creator and as someone who evaluates people's content, do you have any last pieces of advice that you would want to give someone listening that is hoping to get into media, that they're hoping to have to maybe be some version of an influencer themselves or to be able to work for themselves as a content creator? Do you have a couple pieces of advice that you'd want to close with uh, to help them make yeah. that path? Yeah, I think, you know, anyone that is serious about doing it, you know, they have to stick with it. Um, and have a passion for it. W regardless if it's, you know, they want to shoot vehicles, they want to shoot landscapes, they want to, you know, do more adventure travel, just be consistent and uh, just really just also find the right mentors. I mean, that's key. You know, you need to find people that have done it, people that have, uh, have uh, found their calling and follow those people, see, see what their path was, you mm. know, before you can create your own. You know, I think it's rare where someone just right off the bat is, that guy. No, you it's know, impossible. It's, it's hard. And that's so people look like overnight successes, but it takes decades to get there. Usually who, who were some mentors for you that made a big difference that you, that you come, that come to mind for you in, in the, in the creative photography space. Um, I, I mentioned to you earlier when I was at the, uh, my older agency, I'd worked for a, a photographer that came from the skate world. Um, his name is Michael Ballard. And so I assisted him for years, you know, even before I picked up a camera um, he, he was definitely a mentor in, in terms of, uh, you know, going on shoots, getting some of that experience under my belt. Sure. And then I would say some of my contemporaries and, and friends now are, you know, I really, uh, I look up to them, guys like Larry Chen, Will Rogi, DC Chavez, Jose Martinez. These are all guys that you might not be familiar with, but they have been, they definitely made an impact on my life and, and you've that's probably awesome. seen their work before. You yeah, know? that's and, amazing. And, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that I've been, I was able to meet all of these people, you know, and having that role, at, um, doing the PR for, for formula drift where I got to meet them at, in the early stages of their careers. And, you know, seeing guys like the, all of the Hoonigan team, you know, wow. take off from where they are to, sure. to where they're at now. It's Amazing. like, it's incredible, you know, and the content that, that they're generating and the audience that they have now, it's, yeah, it's, it's mind blowing. And just to see these guys that were like going like six deep in a motel room, <laughs> you know, to like now <laughs> traveling the world, you know, and it's, it's, it's insane. It's, you know, we're very uh, fortunate to be able to, to do what we do and, yes. you know, and have the friends that we have. Um, I do have to mention some of the guys that I work with that, you know, that are friends and fantastic uh, creators and overlanders, you know, uh, Richard and Ashley Lindbergh and Carissa Gondurton, um, Mac and Owen from Bound for Nowhere. Like those guys, I really look up to them because they're able to, do what they want to do. They're still creating, they're traveling. And it's, you know, I can't do that. I, I because I'm a little bit older and I have a mortgage and a family, and, you know, <laughs> sure. and uh, maybe later on, <laughs> but uh, you know, those guys are uh, definitely people that I, I look up to. Yeah, no, that's, that's such great advice. And it, it is so important that we surround ourselves with other people that inspire us. Uh, and it makes all the difference. Uh, one of the questions that we like to ask on the podcast, and it's okay if you don't have an answer for this, but are there any books or uh, readings that you've done that have been really formative to your life, either as a creative or as a traveler? Are there books that you have found are just, and it can even be about philosophy or psychology, books that have been really formative for you? Yeah, I've read a lot of books and uh, you know, I've transitioned more to podcasts and, and uh, audible books. Um, I think one that really stands out um, is Tipping Point by Ma Malcolm Gladwell. I was given that by one. one of my mentors, but more on the marketing side of things, and that was a, a good one. One more recent um, audio book that I, I listened to, I think that that was interesting and entertaining, and is one of those books that, or one of those reads that you wanted to just keep listening to and finish, was Will Smith's. Oh, wow, like Just cool. hearing his story was really cool. Um, the founder of Patagonia's uh, book was really inspiring as well. And was it the Teach My People to Surf, something like something that? Something like yeah. that, yeah, yeah. I don't really remember. It. Yvonne Chouinard, yeah. yes. And uh, that, you know, just the company culture. And I, you know, I, I really enjoy, like, the foundings of companies and, and brands and how people built what they, they've done. And so one of my favorite podcasts is How I Built This. And that, you know, that one's really uh, great suggestion. inspiring. Yeah, that one uh, started listening to... I listen to yours. I listen to a couple on the way up here. Sure. You know, and like, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of content out there, you know, and yeah. you know, it's uh, and a lot of books that are, 
that are great. Have you read Shoe Dog yet? The Nike story? Yes, that's oh, that, actually one of my favorites of all time. It is. Yeah, yeah I, I listened to that as an audiobook while I was on a motorcycle up through South America, and I was just enraptured in this guy's story. It was just unbelievable what they went through oh my God. to get through that. It's just incredible. And incredible. And imagine being Onasuka Tiger and just yeah. regretting every minute of it. Yeah. Incre- you know? incre- yeah. Incredible. Yeah. That's such a good story. How do people find out more about you? How do they follow you on Instagram, see your photography and creative work? What are some ways that people can follow you? Uh, so I mainly focus on Instagram and my, my handle is at, at John, J-O-H-N underscore Pangolinan, P-A-N-G-I-L-I-N-A-N. And, um, or you can just check out the website at J-P- and.co so jp and co is the company nice man well thank you so much for being on the podcast today we look forward to having your truck out in the field tomorrow and shooting that video with it and sharing it with our audience but uh enjoy your day tomorrow and safe travels home john thank you thanks for having me yeah thank you